This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, USC public policy professor Elizabeth Kirit Hawkett discusses her book, The Overlooked Americans. She argues that rural and urban America have more in common than what Americans have been led to believe. She's interviewed by former Senator Heidi Heitkamp, Democrat from North Dakota. Thanks, everyone, for joining us for this really important conversation, not just about this book, about, but about the challenges that we have of bringing people in our country together. Elizabeth, you're, this book, is it was a thrill for me to read it, um, in part because there's a little confirmation bias going on with me. I think a lot of what you're talking about are things that I've experienced personally coming from rural America, but also um, uh, things I've been talking a lot about um, and to have someone uh, write a book and provide all of this incredible research and data analysis that you do in this book that confirms what we've been saying for a long time, which is that we aren't all that different in this country. And so a first question that I have for you, because I looked at your bio and you've written about art in New York, you've written about celebrity, you've written about a lot of different topics, but you haven't written before about rural America. And so um, as the daughter of Danville, Pennsylvania, what drove you to write this book? Oh, that's a wonderful question, Senator Heitkamp. Thank you for asking and, and thank you for being with me today. Um, so two reasons, actually. So I have always been a student of culture. Um, My earlier work, I looked at the production of culture, particularly artistic culture and creativity. Um, My later work looked, my last book, The Sum of Small Things, looked at the consumption of culture and, uh, and, and why we consume certain culture and not other culture. And in that book, I really started thinking deeply about this concept of cultural capital, which is sort of our you know, the resources we amass in terms of our education, in terms of what we read, what we watch, what we listen to, um, and that these become signifiers to the world at large. And something that's resounded, and I remember reading a sociologist piece on this, which really stuck with me, which is that everyone has culture. And I think what happened, and in my last book, I really delved deeply into this, was this idea that there's this elite cultural capital. You read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, you listen to NPR, you went to an Ivy League university, you have a law degree, you know, any myriad um, kind of attributes that associated with a particular kind of cultural capital. And I really started thinking that we had this wrong, that this wasn't, this was a form of cultural capital. It wasn't the only form of cultural capital. And I really started thinking about it vis-a-vis where I grew up, because I grew up in this small town in rural Pennsylvania. Um, I'm the daughter of Irish immigrants. I was born in West Virginia. And this collision occurred where I was thinking about this idea of cultural capital and what it really meant and how it was different for different people, along with what was going on with the 2016 presidential elections. That's when these ideas started percolating for me, um, which was that everyone in my circles and and the media I was reading was talking about how rural America was really angry. And that's why they voted for uh, Donald Trump. And that's why um, we had this, we had this divided country. And I thought about the place I grew up in, the place I lived, I don't know, 13 years of my life, you know, and I thought, I don't think that's entirely what's going on. It's not that it's not some of the story, but there's a deeper story. And so that was that kind of blending of understanding the culture of my hometown and rural America and understanding more deeply what might be happening in rural America um, rather than this, what I felt was a stereotypical, uh, you know, uh, explanation of, of why folks voted for Donald Trump. Yeah, I, I mean, when I was reading the book, I actually thought that a maybe a more appropriate title for your thesis wasn't, you know, the overlooked Americans, but the misunderstood Americans. Oh, I like that. The people that every, yeah. That, I do. I wish I, wish I talked to you before there, the right? book. That's a wonderful <laughs> title. Um, but I think, I think it's absolutely true. I think there's so much misunderstanding of both um, uh, of, of what that urban culture is, of what the rural culture is, and, and really a misunderstanding of the people who live in those places. And, and with that comes a lot of judgment. But throughout the book, you explore a lot of data. 
um, that that I think is analyzed in a very macro sense um, when people talk about rural America. Um, but you drill down and do great storytelling about the people who live there, but also draw some contrasts in in how we need to look differently at the data that we're looking at. And one of the spots that I was particularly um, taken with is this notion, because I get it all the time, that rural America voted for Donald Trump because they're racist. And I think your book just does such a phenomenal job of exploring that avenue. Could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, if you if you disagree with me um, on on how this perception and attitude is about uh, racial uh, attitudes in rural America, and then talk a little bit about why you made that such a big part of your book. Oh, thank you. That's a that's a wonderful question, Senator Heitkamp. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, that really spoke to me when I was engaging in this research. Um, first of all, was my experience of living in small town America. Um, but then, you know, as a social scientist, you go in, you do the homework, you, you say, well, my experience is one experience. There's a lot of ob- observations out there that need to be undertaken. So I spoke to dozens and dozens of rural Americans in all sorts of places, from Missouri to Texas to Tennessee to the heart of Appalachia to Pennsylvania to Ohio. And I asked them a lot of questions about, you know, big big questions about democracy and then questions about equality in this country. And one thing that was abundantly clear to me was that rural Americans were as keenly aware and concerned about the issues of racial equality in our country as their urban counterparts. You know, it was the first thing that came to mind, um, you know, that people are treated differently. They're treated differently because of the color of their skin. That's not right. We've got to do something about it. And this was over and over again when I asked the question of, do you think America is an equal place? And, you know, essentially, why or why not? You know, I don't think there was anyone who thought that America was an equal place. And most folks said it's not an equal place because people are treated unequally because of their skin color. Um, and some ventured into because of their class, because of how much money they make. But really, the the racial element was very clear, the sensitivity to that. So one thing that, you know, when you do qualitative work, you always have to be wary of is are, are, are the people you're speaking to telling you what you want to hear? You know, they know, you know, I'm in this West Coast, you know, liberal academic. Uh, you know, they know my politics without even having a conversation with me. And so you think, oh, maybe they're just telling me what they know I want to hear. But I then looked at the University of Chicago, and I know you're based there as well. Um, uh, you looked at the University of Chicago's general social survey, and they do these amazing surveys of folks, and they've been doing it for decades on all sorts of issues. And I looked at the questions on um, race and how rural versus urban Americans responded. And, you know, the first, the top line takeaway is they largely feel the same way. Um, they are they are largely supportive um, and and not supportive of social policies in equal measure. And the biggest surprising um, takeaway for me was that some of the greatest champions for social intervention um, to elevate um, the black community to elevate women were actually the least educated folks in rural America. It wasn't you know the poster child of, you know, the progressive coastal elite um, that was, you know, responding, um, you know, to, you know, the support of, you know, certain kinds of social policies along the lines of race. It was actually these uneducated rural Americans, these Americans who didn't have a high school degree. And I thought, wow, that is a really surprising takeaway. And those survey results really corroborated exactly what the people I spoke to said, you know? Yeah, and, and and I want to get into kind of the economics uh, later on, but I want to I want to um, explore the work that you did in analyzing who is rural America. I mean, if you probably and this is a generalization, and I hate that when I do it, <laughs> but if you probably talk to you know grab anyone at a mall or in, in a suburbia or grab someone down uh, downtown or in Manhattan and ask them 
who lives in rural America, chances are they're going to say conservative, older, white people who don't like us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, you, you do some great work talking about regional differences on who lives in rural America. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it builds on your, your, um, your warning to people who want to have an opinion about rural America, builds on your warning that don't just draw with a broad brushstroke. The South is different than the Midwest economically. And, and uh, certainly uh, the South has many more uh, African-Americans who live in rural America. In my neck of the woods, many more Native Americans who live in rural America. We're seeing a growing number of Hispanic people who have moved for economic opportunity in rural America. Can you talk a little bit about kind of regional differences in demographics and what surprised you what didn't surprise you, and how that plays into kind of the prevailing attitudes about rural America. So I, I think that's 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 a really wonderful uh, you know, takeaway. Is that you know to, to to talk about rural America is to hide a million different things that is go, there is going on in these in these places. Um, so one thing that's really clear to me is that. Um, even if we're, if we're talking about social policy or we're talking about economic development and we talk about rural versus urban America or just rural America and this kind of takeaway that rural America is in decline, you know, you got to footnote that. Um, I would actually argue that rural America is thriving on a number of different metrics, um, but that there are certain regions that are in trouble and they're in, in a very different situation for economic, social and to a certain extent, cultural reasons. Um, so one thing that was really clear to me was that this idea of rural America in decline really was actually a story about two parts of America, um, one being Appalachia, which is, which is in trouble, um, and the other being the Deep South. And these are places that are economically depressed. They have significantly lower... Um, percentages of the population with a bachelor's degree or above. And there is not as much of the knowledge um, industries coming into them. And I'll spend, I'll spend a little time with that in a moment. Um, and so, so that's, I think, a, a very different story um, than if you look at, for example, um, you know, the, the eastern seaboard, if you look at the coastal west, if you look at the Midwest, which is thriving um, on so many different metrics. I mean, the heartland is a great, I mean, you know, if you want to have a great life, move to Iowa. <laughs> I mean, they seem to be just, I mean, from the sheer numbers and the people I talk to, it seems like a great place to be. Um, so, so I think that that is really important. And then in terms of, and, and you actually did a great job highlighting the heterogeneity of the um, ethnic and racial composition of these um, different rural areas. They look so much different from one another. Um, and, and also, that they, yes, there are older folks in rural America, but there are also younger folks. And one contrast I really like to make is, you know, when we talk about urbanity or cities, right? So for many of us, we think Los Angeles, New York, Washington, D.C., and so forth. And yet we also lump, you know, Akron, Ohio, um, or Buffalo in the same story. And yet they have a very different economic situation than, you know, these, you know, quote unquote, superstar cities. And I want to say it's the same with rural America. So rural America has places that fit that stereotype. They're, they're poor. Um, people are, do not have um, college degrees. They maybe have a higher proportion of folks who ha haven't finished high school. They don't have a lot of industry. Um, sure, absolutely, those places exist. And that's, a, that's actually a real opportunity for policy to um, create more bespoke targeted interventions. But then you have like coastal New England um, or rural Iowa or, you know, rural Wyoming. And actually those places have high owner, high home ownership, high um, employment rates, very low unemployment, high medium household incomes. And then you see both um, the concentration of uh, industries associated with them, like agriculture, um, in, in the Midwest. But then you also see um, the trickling in of 
other industries like software um, and certain parts of finance um, that actually do end up in our rural areas, despite the fact that we associate these as city city occupations, city sectors. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that I remind people, because I think, again, that image of rural America is really agricultural America, but a third of all rural counties are dependent on mineral extraction, Mm -hmm. which has been created in the places you're talking about, where we've seen, you know, decline, Appalachia, uh, are places where mineral extraction is not uh, the economy that it used to be. And so I want to talk a little bit about rural self-image. Um, because you do explore this whole thing in your book about cognitive dissidence. You know, it's kind of like, here we are, the rugged Americans, individualists, um, we just count on ourselves and we don't, you know, we don't need the government. We don't need um, uh, to be, uh, uh, we don't need the, the boost up. But yet, if you look, if I'm, if I'm representing urban America and you see now Gavin Newsom has been doing a lot of interviews talking about blue state economies versus red state economies. A lot of that driven by rural issues and the per capita expenditure in rural America from the federal government's much higher um, than per capita in in suburban areas. And so you look at all these measurements and and this kind of attitude about who who they are and how people look at them. Um, And and I, I think in your book, you drew a lot of you know, examples from what people were listening to, what people were hearing in terms of their their uh, grievance. But can you talk a little bit about this um, this chapter that you wrote on cognitive dissidents and and what your conclusions were um, relative to kind of self image versus maybe the image uh, urban America would have, but also the image that data would would inform. Um, wow, that's a that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Senator Heitkamp. I, I uh, I've got a, a lot to say. Um, so <laughs> let me try to coalesce my thoughts here. Uh, so this this chapter starts out with this wonderful woman, uh, Shannon, and I met Shannon through that kind of a network of folks I didn't know, and then they recommend this a method called snowball snowball sampling, where you kind of get um, contacts through the people you interview and so forth. And at some point, I um, landed upon Shannon's name, and I emailed her, and she wrote me back. That was one of the most warming experiences of this book, was the fact that these folks who did not know me and had absolutely, there was nothing in it for them, every time I'd send them an email, they would respond um, immediately, I mean, and give me hours of their time. So um, Shannon was one of those people And um, when we first spoke, uh, I, you know, I asked her my usual run of questions, the same questions I ask everyone. And, you know, you just sometimes you have these energies with people. I just kind of I really liked her. Like there was just this kind of energy I got from her and just as people we clicked. And yet what she would say was totally the opposite of how I thought about the world, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was just the weirdest experience of, like, really liking her, wanting to, like, grab a coffee with her, and yet also thinking, wait a second, you are, you haven't gotten vaccinated, you're, you've made it very clear you're not planning to, you really don't believe in climate change, um, you question the 2020 election, um, you're a big supporter of Donald Trump, um, you um, and you are you question marriage equality, and these were literally anathema to my way of being and my politics. And yet, there was such a warmth, and I enjoyed every time we had a chance to connect. I enjoyed it so tremendously, and I thought a lot about this, and I realized that the problem, and and you you know you you. Um, you know, cited the chapter's title, Cognitive Dissonance. The problem is, you know, this idea that um, you feel these kinds of seemingly opposing sentiments about something, some person, some issue, right? But in reality, I, I had this kind of breakthrough, which was that I was losing sight of the things about Shannon that were why I liked her. You know, so I was focusing so much on this discord in our politics and not realizing there were really 
good reasons to like Shannon. So one of the things that just really kind of overwhelmed me was a question I asked all of the people I uh, interview is, if you had all the money in the world, what would you do? And, you know, people say all sorts of things. They say, I would buy my mom a house. I would go on vacation. I would pay off my mortgage. I donate it, you know, you know, any number of things. But Shannon, when I asked her that question, she said, well, I would, um, I would, I would buy uh, an orphanage and, um, I would buy an orphanage for all of the children who have lost their parents to drug addiction. It's a real problem here. I'm paraphrasing her. Um, Mm -hmm. And she said, I would also buy all of the people, the people who are recovering drug addicts, I would buy them new teeth because you don't smile if you don't have teeth. And it was so specific. It's incredible. So, So I have a question for you. Do you think Shannon changed her opinion about the the class or the the group that you represent as you know you talk a lot about how it, listening um was so important and, and and i think with shannon you may have said look i i didn't want to get it i didn't want to tell her she was wrong on her facts yeah. because that wasn't my job um yeah. you know I, I just thought that was so interesting that you interjected that in the book because it would have been my reaction as an interviewer but yet that neutrality that you felt but do you think that that of all the people that you interviewed for this book that they see you know rural or or let's let's just put a label on it cultural elites uh, academic elites do they do they see them differently because you reached out you know i would love to take credit heidi i would love to but you know what i don't think they ever judged us in the first place <laughs> I don't go. think they ever did. I mean, you get my, send my email out to these folks introducing myself. I'm doing this book. They see my signature. I'm a professor at the U, at USC in Los Angeles. They wrote me back anyway. Um, and I would like to believe I would do the same. But I, I wonder, you know, would I immediately have my backup? I mean, now I wouldn't. I feel extremely changed by the work I did. But I think that's the thing we lose sight, that they are the folks that I interviewed from rural America weren't judgmental from the get go. And Shannon, you know, oh, sorry, please go ahead. No, I was just I was just going to say this kind of proves the point of your book, which is when you look at data or you look at classification or labels, then then we all have assumptions. Yeah. But when we are operating one on one there really aren't those judgments. There really aren't those. I mean, you didn't come to this with judgment. Had you come to it with judgment, it would have been a different outcome than the book that you presented. But, you know, I I think, you know, I always tell people, they say, so-and-so is mad at me. I say, go stand next to him for 15 minutes. They can't stay mad forever, right? And so I think one one of the things that that you talked about, and, and I think this is true from, from my work, you talked about how we look at privilege differently. You know, we, there's been a lot of dialogue, you know, that we've, we've got this whole example of, um, you know, CRT and what's happening in terms of how we perceive our history and what we're willing to say about our history. And and um, I, I think the, the privilege discussion in your book was so interesting because it, 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 it reflected um, a, a true kind of difference between maybe how white urban Americans see themselves and white rural Americans see themselves. Can you talk a little bit about your um, your analysis of the whole privilege uh, issue? Yes, I, I I'm so glad you brought that up. It's a, a, I'm I'm glad you appreciated that section because that was something that was a real insight for me as well. You know, as a researcher, you're you don't go in knowing everything by any means. So that was a real discovery for me to appreciate these different understandings of the word. So for, you know, to, you know, right off the bat, um, urban Americans are much more sensitive to privilege than I think even their own ilk um, believe them to be. You know, I mean, there's this idea that, you know, a lot of these wealthy, educated urban Americans, these kind of meritocrats, are living in these bubbles, 
inured to the troubles of the world. And I've written actually a lot about that in my previous book. But when I spoke to urban Americans about privilege, one, it was immediately about material wealth um, and about having re- physical resources, tangible resources. And there was a tremendous amount of guilt, self-awareness, um, even angst about the privilege. And at times I remember this one woman who was kind of mad at herself because she was so aware, so sentient of her privilege and also sentient of the fact that she was not happy. You know, she just was kept striving, striving, striving. So I actually thought that it really created a much more sympathetic portrayal of our understanding of, you know, privileged coastal elites. Rural America. You know, it, it, oh, go ahead. No, please, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go no, ahead. no, no, you please. I, I was, I, I mean, I, ju- I just want to, um, you know, when, when uh, I get into these discussions, because I'm frequently called on to explain why is it that rural America does this? And I'm like, well, you know, I <laughs> I guess I'll try. I don't, <laughs> there's, there's big generalizations in that whole dialogue. But on privilege, the one thing that I would say is, look, you know, they see the whole privilege argument. And I think this was kind of recurring throughout your book, the whole privilege argument as a criticism of maybe their success or a criticism, uh, you know, kind of says, look, where you are, you didn't earn, you got because you're white. And they're kind of like, well, I don't think that's true. I earned what I have and I've worked really hard and I I didn't own a slave. I, I, I've not, I don't have my boot on anyone's neck. So why are you blaming me um, for, for the disparity that you see in society? And I, I think that's a real um, important uh, kind of dialogue. And I think you delved into that somewhat, which is look, you know, um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I recognize that we all start from different places and yet your book certainly points that out in terms of the data, but yet I as an individual will be responsible for only my actions, not the actions of history or the actions of others. I, yeah, so that was, that was a sentiment that was clear in my interviews with rural Americans. And I think on two fronts, first is that the rural Americans, and they didn't use those words um, yeah. uh, at all. Um, but two things that really st- stuck out to me was, were, first was that privilege was was kind of defined differently for them. So privilege was about ac- the ability to do what you want, um, the ability to have food on the table, you know, just kind of very, very basic stuff. I remember um, a farmer from Iowa Craig, he was so interesting. He just said, I just come and go as my please. I'd never, you, and he actually had, he, he was a really endearing person, but he wrote me, um, you know, just recently about this as well. And, and he said, you know, when we, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, I, uh, I, I, I was just at church the other day and the pastor was talking about white privilege. And I, I'd never thought about it like that, but you know, I guess he's right. That's what it is. But I guess I just I can come and go as I please. And I think that was that was a really interesting thing that it was about that kind of freedom rather than about the house and the private schools, you know, very different kind of view of privilege. Um, the other thing that I think you you get at, although it wasn't what they it wasn't their words, but but I had a few folks say, you know, look, I work really hard or I've come from tremendous poverty. You know, I mean, one man I spoke to, he was in Missouri his wife was a, a judge. And he said, you know, I, I have friends who grew up on dirt floors. My wife, she had like six siblings and they had no money. And she worked so hard to get where she is. I just, I don't know how you can call this privilege, you know, um, you know, implying essentially, you know, she worked really hard to get here. I just don't know why we should take away from that from her. So that was his view. Um, and that was a sentiment that that was echoed a number of times in the conversations I had with folks in, in rural America. Yeah, and, and, and the flip side of that, although not really explored in your book, was kind of the belief that that um, if people didn't uh, uh, raise themselves up from, uh, you know, a dirt floor, that somehow that's on them. Um, and and so, you know, kind of this idea of rewarding hard work and everybody's hard work will receive equal reward. Um, I want to I want to turn now to your chapter. 
I, I actually had not thought about the Appalachia, um, West Virginia drug problem in the same context as what you presented it. And I thought that was fascinating about yeah. um, the top 20 counties uh, with drug overdoses, 12 are in West Virginia. Yeah. And and a lot of what you learned was this, this built on mining injuries, people who work hard, who may in fact have back problems, who were prescribed opioids, ending up with, um, with this, uh, uh, you know, this huge challenge. And I think in the same chapter, I, I, you have to correct me, um, you talk about um, uh, Donald Trump, why vote for Donald Trump? And, and I, I thought it was the best description that I had heard. He was a great salesman of hope. Yeah. And that came from one of your interviews. Yeah. And I, I think, um, so the attitude, um, the attitudes about addiction in, in America have changed. I mean, if we compare the opioid uh, fentanyl um, uh, crisis with the crisis of um, crack cocaine um, in urban America, attitudes are different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people who would say, well, those attitudes are different because of the populations that have been affected. But um, can you talk a little bit about um, this kind of deaths of despair, how how that plays into kind of self-image, but also um, overall image uh, in in the country about rural America and about certain populations. Of course. Um, so um, I first of all, I have to really give a shout out to Eric Iyer, who is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who wrote Death in Mudlick, and he exposed the corruption with opioids in West Virginia. He was a tremendous resource for me. I mean, I talked to him. He was really so, so helpful. Um, and Jason Doctor, who's a colleague of mine at USC who studies addiction, and they both had a really interesting regional perspective um, that I'll, I'll tie into my response. Um, so I think, first of all, one of the things that was so interesting about Angus Deaton and Ann Case's work on Deaths of Despair is this idea of, I mean, and they, they draw from Durkheim's work on, on why we, we people end up in a position of despair and, 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 and for some suicide, uh, and whether it's intentional suicide or some sort of negligence in overdose, that their expectations for their lives don't match up to reality. And I think that must be quite devastating. And I, I don't mean in these kinds of Oh, I, you know, when you're 10 years old, you want to be famous. And when you're 30 years old, you're a, a doctor with a family of five. I mean, I don't mean that because that's still kind of amazing. <laughs> um, I mean, that really like their lives are in, tr in tr incredible trouble. They don't have options. And the mining um, injuries are, are huge because what happens, of course, is that they're already in regions that aren't economically very vital. And so if they get injured, and mining goes away, which it did a lot over the last um, 10, 15 years, then you really are in trouble afterwards. You don't have a livelihood. You don't know what's going to happen next. And you've been prescribed these drugs, and they're already heavily addictive. Um, and so that's that kind of downward spiral, spiral that happens in these very isolated parts of rural America. Um, and, and another thing, and, and I, I don't I don't know this to be true, but my colleague Jason Doctor talked to me about this, that there's a, a, a different attitude perhaps, or at least historically, a different attitude towards prescribing these drugs, um, and that in rural America there might have been more of um, more relaxed. I don't know if you've had a chance to read Barbara Kingsolver's Demon Copperhead yet. Um, Heidi, yeah. I don't, have you read it yet? Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I mean, I just... Oh, you can't see me nodding. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, okay, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary <laughs> book, right? And I think she does, a, even though it's a work of fiction, um, because she's from the region and she's done so much research, um, she does such a great job of documenting that slippery space. You know, you have the injury, you get prescribed, the doctor's being very casual about it, they give you too much, they're not really thinking about the addiction... Or they are thinking about it. I mean, her in her case, there was this whole racket going on in the town where the doctor was actually kind of essentially selling drugs on the side. But anyway, the point being that that is this kind of unique thing. 
And this is where Donald Trump does come in. And and the great salesman of hope is actually Arlie Hochschild's um, phrasing. Um, actually, she she used that phrase to describe him in reviewing uh, Deaths of Despair for The New York Times. And I thought it was great. I actually ran it by Eric Iyer. And he said, yeah, I, yeah, that's exactly right. And And what I think she meant by it and what I see in looking at that region, this was a person who came in. And whatever you say about his politics and his personal life, and that's just not the topic of our conversation today, um, he didn't judge and he made them feel that someone was going to get get them out of where they were. And that hope is intoxicating. You know, I mean, it is so intoxicating mm-hmm. and no one else had offered it to them. So it, it's kind of irrelevant as to whether it was fact or fiction in that moment. It was something to believe in when they had nothing to believe in. You know, and when you when you go back and you take a look at kind of this whole, you know, kind of we take care of ourselves, we take responsibility for ourselves, but yet this addiction um, is is bigger than just one community. It's bigger. It, it is a nationwide issue. And so it's interesting we're looking at now the lawsuits against the opioid uh, manufacturers, um, these pill mills, and, and I just want to want to um, add to your analysis about, you know, how did this happen? The permanent subcommittee on investigations for the Homeland Security Committee actually did a, a pretty extensive investigation of these pill mills and 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 why it was regionally you saw more addiction, more prescriptions and a lot of it was driven by money and so uh, those those culpable hopefully will find responsibility but i think think it's just so interesting um when when we uh think about kind of addiction um in the comparison between the crack e- epidemic and the opioid epidemic is is really is it is it just racial is it time as we see addiction differently you know um you know, this kind of uh, attitude about self-help and self-responsibility. Uh, just just want to throw it out there as as a kind of challenging inconsistency. Um, I want to turn to um, uh, uh, the media um, because I just went through a, um, a focus group in Southern Illinois where I watched people and universally, I, I don't care what your political ilk is if you ask people what's wrong in america they'll give you two answers social media and the media the mass media yeah. and right i mean that's what that, that that's the root of all evil is the media i mean i don't even have um, a and, facebook and ask- account anymore i mean I, I i lost my password like five years ago and i i was like well that's that's just i'm never going to be going on that site again <laughs> so, yeah, but you're you're, not, you're you're not missing it. No, right? exactly. No, not so, at all. <laughs> well, and it and it does it it does in some ways. You know, when you look at how disconnected we feel one on one, you know that that ability to just text and not pick up the phone and make a phone call. Yeah. But I want to read out of uh, page one hundred and seventy two, and and you ask this question: Why do we have such distorted views of each other's opinions and beliefs? which I think is critical. If in reality, many of us have fairly understandable political perspectives. And I I think that's absolutely true, this attitude where there's so much judgment about people who have different kind of political ideas. And you said one reason that a number of my interviews mentioned was the media. Talk a little bit about their attitudes about, about the media, what they watch and how that shapes perspective and and not attitudes just about you know their own sense of grievance if that if i can use that word i think one of the things that you tried to do in this book and i think did in this book was get rid of that word that these are not angry uh, grieving people these are people who fairly are fairly happy happy with their life have challenges yes but are meeting those challenges and and not blaming anyone else for those challenges. So let's talk a little bit about media and media consumption because a lot of the people who will look at this uh, this discussion about your book will be very curious about how people saw the media, what media did they consume, and how that affected their perspectives. So yeah, that's a that's a terrific question and. Um... One thing that was really clear, I mean, I'm really glad you highlighted this idea that 
that I wanted to get across was that it wasn't a sense of grievance or anger. It was very matter of fact. You know, I mean, even talking about the media, it was, yeah, it, I think it creates divide, you know. Um, and, um, and even when I asked them questions about, you know, what do you think, you know, elite media or coastal elites think of you? And some of them, you know, I remember this one woman saying, I think they probably just think we're a bunch of hillbillies. But she wasn't like distressed about it. It was a sort of acceptance of the state of affairs, um, which, which in itself is poignant and, and, and sad, too, if that's where we are. Um, but yes, yeah, so so th- there was a real sense that the media was responsible for this narrative. Um, and in terms of what they consumed, you know, it it really um, was across the spectrum. Uh, you know, there were folks who consumed Fox News and CNN and, you know, some some folks even, you know, um, you know, read some very kind of kind of urban, you know, New York Times, Wall Street Journal and so forth. So in terms of the media, it it, there wasn't a through line, which I think actually shouldn't be surprising because rural America is a very diverse, interesting place with lots of different perspectives. So big surprise that the, their media consumption is is equal to that. Um, there was an, a, a, something that I have actually argued about this in my last book, too, that some of the media that was consumed would be, say, um, you know, on YouTube or on Facebook, and there would be um, you know, conversations about folks who were kind of known to um, promote misinformation. And the problem I see is that a lot of our really good journalism, our really good media is is really out of reach for a lot of people in rural America. And it's really out of reach if you're not willing to, you know, pay a subscription. And, and the subscription to a lot of this media is pretty expensive. Um, and so for me, that was a really big part of this, is which I think if you, if there was much more equal access to news, um, you know, you could like, for example, like I have a subscription to the New York Times and I have a subscription to the Wall Street Journal through USC. That's great. I can play around with these different view, political views. I can go onto Fox News if I want to see how they're reacting to something. I, you know, get, you know, the New Yorker um, every day, their daily. So you get, a, you get a sense of everything that's going on when you have that kind of access. But, you know, I'm a professor in Los Angeles. I'm able to afford the subscription to the New York Times. My university provides the Wall Street Journal for free. You know, it's, it's, it's different, you know. And I also kind of have a sense because of that, my cultural capital, of places I can get fairly even um, and high quality uh, information about what's going on in my country. Yeah. And so that so, was something so I, think, I thought was limited. I, I want to challenge you a little bit on that. So if I, if, if, if I decided I was going to have all the money in the world mm-hmm. and I could buy anything and I bought um, all these folks subscriptions to the New York times, the wall street journal, financial times, let's, yeah. let's, you know, let's throw in the, you know, the economists, yeah. um, you know, all of the, uh, the, the, kind of outlets that we read kind of on a regular basis for additional analysis, would they read them? You know, Heidi, it's a great question, but as I say to my own children, <laughs> why don't we try? <laughs> you know, I mean, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way at all. That's That probably landed incorrectly. What I mean is we don't know. And that's the problem. We make a lot of assumptions. Oh, you know, would would my friend Shannon in Kentucky pick up the New York Times. You know what? She's reading my book right now. I think she would. <laughs> so I think we well, need to give people it, a chance. Yeah, and but I think you know, the, by the same token, um, I, there's bias on the other side. Uh, would they read the latest report from the Cato Institute? Would they read the latest report from the Heritage Foundation? Would they um, uh, have a have a willingness to read what the Federalist Society is publishing? And so I think. I think there's just this this media question is just so tough yeah. because it goes to kind of um, a, a willingness to only listen to things that you can agree with um, in, yeah. in, in a lot of ways. Well, I, I want to I want to turn to, I want to turn to because we don't have a lot of time. It's gone so fast. I know. I but really I want to turn to your to, dis- you. to your discussion about meritocracy. Okay. And this hit particularly close to home because I used to tell people. I just want to, you know, when I was in the Senate, I just want to vote for a judge who graduated from the University of North Dakota, not Harvard or Yale or, you know, uh, 
Stanford, you know, the elite uh, law schools, university, and I have to hold my own institution in there, the University of Chicago. I didn't go to law school there, but um, certainly have an affiliation now with the University of Chicago. Yeah. And, and um, so I want to ask you kind of um, this question. It's maybe bigger than your book, but why do you think it is that society values a, an economics degree from Harvard uh, at a higher level than an economics degree from the University of North Dakota? Wow. Well, now, if I had the answer to that question, I'd be in a different <laughs> business making a lot of money. <laughs> um, uh, so I I think it has, there's a path dependency, right? So, you know, I'm not a historian of universities, but at some point in time, Harvard produced um, graduates who ended up for myriad reasons in positions of power and that becomes a recursive process because we know our social capital is really important you help people who are you know uh alumnus of your of your alma mater and so that path you know over and over and over again and i'm 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 certain actually that someone's written a book on on the sort of the history of the ivies in this respect um, there may yeah. also be a uh, self-selection in the sense that at some point, Harvard and and Ivies and Ivy equivalents, um, they um, become, because they're known to produce graduates who get great jobs and jobs in positions of power, people who already have power or who have wealth send their kids there. And, you know, as some studies have showed, you know, kids who come from families that are already wealthy or families that are already have, you know, or have power. They, it, the, the, the Ivy is, is sort of, you do it, but that's doesn't, that's the game. The Ivy league isn't the game changer. The game changer, the Ivy league is the game changer for first generation college students, for poor kids and for minorities that can really change. But if you're already rich and powerful and you go to this university that produces rich and powerful people, you know, I, I'm not sure it's really a game changer for you, but that's what you do. Um, and so it creates that kind of, do of, um, you know, elitism and um, and privilege and then also just actually, you know, the ability to be much more upwardly mobile mobile with that degree. Now, by the way, this is not to yeah. discredit folks who go there. The, they are very smart. <laughs> um, these are very hard universities to go to get into. So that also becomes part of the process is that they become even more competitive. Um, well, but I think they, that's the I, dynamic. I, I, yeah, and then I, you know, I want to bring this back to the urban-rural kind of dialogue because um, I think more and more of these universities are trying to recruit first-generation um, uh, students from uh, rural areas. But I, I think I think it also perpetuates um, this idea that a lot of your listeners talked about, or a lot of your interviewees talked about working really hard, maybe being first generation graduates of institutions, but not having that institution, uh, institutional degree valued as high as maybe um, kind of more the, the elite degrees. And so I think this idea of, um, and, and I always tell uh, students, and, and I said, look, you know, uh, that that degree may get you an interview and it may get you hired because people like to brag, I have five Harvard degree, but I said it won't, five years out, it won't matter. What will matter is your work performance. And so, you know, and I think, I think that in this, in this time, we don't, we don't honor that uh, University of North Dakota degree, um, or University of South Dakota degree, the same way, even though those students are equally capable. And, and so I think it adds and perpetuates, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a a sense that the system's not really, it's, it's rigged um, uh, for those who, number one, uh, can afford those schools or who have parents where you can get in as a legacy. And so yeah. I, I, mean, I thought I, it, maybe, maybe the better question for me to ask is talk about kind of that chapter on meritocracy and why you thought that was important to put in this book. Well, I thought I, I put it in the book for a few reasons. One was that the people I interviewed in rural America just weren't as amped up about the meritocracy and their children being a part of it as their urban counterparts. And I knew this because I had just my last book, The Sum of Small Things, talked an awful lot about the meritocracy and the attributes of people who are 
were members of or you know aspiring to or wanting their children to to remain on in that world and it just was a totally different vibe when i talked about some of the same issues they just weren't as stressed and you know you might say oh well that's a problem but when I looked at the data on rural America and I used um, Raj Shetty's Opportunity Atlas, he's a, a wonderful uh, professor at uh, Harvard, um, uh, where I, you, know, you can track how kids do, um, you, know, it, you, know, you know, if they're born in a certain place, what, what do things look like when they're 35? And looking in the here and now at the data, I thought, you know, if I lived in many of these rural states, I also wouldn't be so worried because their lives are actually really good. They're just different. I think that's the thing that was really clear to me. And I think for me, it was a learning experience because I think in my world, living in Los Angeles, being a professor, you just assume on some level, or certainly I did, I don't now, um, you know, well, we all want our kids to go to college and we, we hope they get into the best one and we want them to get the best job and the best opportunities. And then I thought, well, that's just one way of looking through the kaleidoscope. I mean, you know, um, people have beautiful lives that aren't, I got into USC or Yale or Stanford, and I'm now working at a hedge fund or, or a publishing company. I mean, people have very meaningful, deep lives without those things happening to them. And, and the yeah. other thing that was really interesting was just that the parents just were less stressed and... I began to realize that the meritocracy was important to the global economic system, the knowledge economy, but it wasn't the only way to be a part of it and to exist in the world, and that you could be very, very happy without being a part of it. Uh, Elizabeth, unfortunately, we're running out of time, and I had a lot more questions. Oh, no way. Oh, my gosh. Wow, that went so fast. (laughs) The economic reality. They're just going to have to read the book to get the full depth of everything that you explored. But I want to close with you on reading part of your your, um, Through the Line, your chapter Through the Line. You said, we must actively try to move beyond the narrative that Americans are hopelessly divided from one another. We must try harder to see humanity in each of us. When I spoke to Americans for this book, I immediately, immediately liked every one of them. And if you had asked me five years ago if I had anything to say or understand about a pastor in Missouri or a young man living in Appalachia or an evangelical who uh, subscribes to conspiracy theories, I would have laughed. Of course not. And this is this is really um, so such an important discussion because we have we have um, used our political divisions our our voting patterns to tell a narrative about the American people that I think is really unfair. And I think this book is so important to explore that. So I'm going to give you the final, um, the, the final kind of few words here about this, this, this paragraph and what, how, what advice you would give to someone who had their eyes open about rural America, how they could further engage, how they could participate, what we need to do as a society to bring ourselves, you know, back together, not politically, but but in terms of understanding, not being misunderstood. Oh, I think that you did a wonderful job. I will try to, to follow. Um, I think the biggest thing we can do, because I'll be honest with you, writing this book really changed my life and it really ch- it really challenged me and in a way that is all for the better i just it's not even just politics and geography like just everything understand most people don't come from a place of hate most people have reason for why they feel the way they do and it's really important to listen even when you don't agree Try to understand. Look, democracy is messy. It is complex. America is. There are a lot of great things that come from that complexity. But it does require us to kind of step up and say, I don't understand why this person is against this or for that, but I'm going to try. Yep. And then the, the one thing I would also say, this is a two-way street. Yes. Um, uh, so often in my work, I, I get to hear about how, um, you know, it, the lazy people in urban America 
you know that that they 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 don't you know they don't appreciate the hard work that we do and and i say why do you say that i mean, my favorite was in in north dakota or, or in north dakota we know our neighbors and i said i've lived all over the country i always knew my neighbors whether it was living in downtown dc portland oregon i always knew my neighbors yeah. and so i think one of the things that that um, we need to, you know, kind of express as well in in this discussion about rural America, is this is a two way street, and yes. and um, not thinking that there are any real Americans. We're all real Americans, and the sooner we decide how we're going to work together um, to improve our country, to move our country forward, the better. And this book, I will tell you, is absolutely an amazing step in the right direction. Um, and, and I again, I have to confess my confirmation bias every time, every chapter I was shaking my head, yes, <laughs> nodding my head, yes, or rather, and saying, yep, that's what, that's, that's what I see. And, oh. and so I want to thank you, Elizabeth, the daughter of Danville, Pennsylvania, which may have something to do with why you wrote this book, your rural yeah. community in Pennsylvania. But I want to thank you for an engaging conversation. And I want to encourage everyone who is concerned about the um, the unity of this country to read this book, because I think it is just such an important discussion about a part of the country that not a lot of people understand any. Oh, thank you, Senator Heitkamp. That was, uh, I'm truly honored to have spent the time with you and for your kind words, really. It's, it's sure such thing. a pleasure. Thank Take you. care. You too. Read the book. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestsellers lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts. 